Hello. Uh, in this video, I'm going to be talking about some things to watch out for uh, when we are doing regression discontinuity or some kinds of diagnostics or different approaches that we might need to take. Uh, so the four things that we're going to cover are windows, uh, granular running variables, manipulated running variables, uh oh, and fuzzy regression discontinuity. So let's get into it. Uh, first, we're going to be talking about windows. So the whole idea of regression discontinuity is that we are looking at the variation around a cutoff. What is the jump at that cutoff. Uh, and really the idea is we want to know, okay, we, on, if we're just narrowing really closely in on the cutoff, then it should basically be random uh, which side of the cutoff you fall on. Now, how closely should we look at the cutoff? Should we look at a wide range around the cutoff or should we look at a narrow range around the cutoff? And uh, that's an important question to think about when you are doing regression discontinuity. And there's a couple of factors that sort of play into it. So for one thing, uh, if we look really closely in uh, to the cutoff, we are likely to be just isolating the people who really we can make a pretty good claim that it's random whether you're on either side, right? If you're doing that, uh, that aptitude test I mentioned and you need to get a cutoff of 90, you know, somebody who got an 89.995 is pretty much the exact same person on average as the person who got a 90.001, right? Those two people are not really very different. Uh, on the other hand, somebody who got an 85 might be very different from somebody who got a 95, right? That might not just be random chance. We could be reintroducing the endogeneity of the running variable back into the model. So wide cutoffs mean that you're potentially reintroducing some endogeneity and some bias into your estimate. However, on the other hand, very narrow cutoffs means that you don't have a lot of people in there. How many people really are there with 89.999 to 80 to 90.001 scores, right? Maybe that's two people and you're comparing two people and that's, that's not really statistically uh, very sound. Uh, so there's that trade-off between uh, precision, statistical precision, the wider you get, the more people you have, the more accurately uh, or the, the less uh, variation there will be in your estimate and more, less sampling variation, but also the more biased because you're introducing people who are actually different as opposed to focusing in really closely, uh, in which case there are fewer people, but also, you know, that's pretty good for your assumptions that are they're like, they're a lot more likely to be true. Uh, another thing about this is that it interacts with the way that we deal with uh, polynomials. So last time I mentioned uh, that you can not just necessarily do linear slopes that, that change on either side of the line, but you can make them curve, right? You can do polynomials that change on either side of the line. Now, two things about that. So one, uh, you don't want to get too crazy with the polynomials, right? You know, you can maybe add a squared term if you think you have a squared thing going on, but once you get into cubics or quartics, uh, can get kind of noisy, right? Remember that the downsides of polynomials is that once you get to the very edges of them, right, on the edges of your data or even outside the range of your data, they tend to flop around wildly and make really crazy predictions. Uh, and if we're thinking about regression discontinuity, we are comparing the very edge of those lines, right? If we have one line over here, one line over here, we're comparing the edge and how they jump over here. So you add a lot of polynomial terms and you might overstate what that jump actually is in ways that aren't actually in the data. Uh, and now using a window can help ease this a little bit because if you focus in really narrowly, there's not much of a difference between a squared a polynomial term with a square uh, and a linear term. So that's some stuff to think about with windows. We can see how this works. So uh, here I have, I'm, I'm doing a very basic version of windowing where I'm literally just cutting the data to the right around the cutoff. Uh, so I'm just running a linear uh, regression discontinuity um, and you can see that the, the true value here is 7, point, uh, that is 0.7 for the effect. And if I have a very wide window here where I'm including the entire range of data, I get a coefficient of 0.75, right? So that's biased. It's not, it's not accurate, right? Uh, now then I start getting in closer. I'm only taking people within 0.25 on either side of the cutoff. And that uh, you know, is still about uh, pretty biased. But once we start getting closer and closer, we get 0.7, right? That's perfect, right? That's, that's pretty much exactly the true, the true value that we're looking for. But then as we continue to narrow in closer and closer, right, we are, we're technically, we're getting rid of bias, but we're introducing so much sampling variation that in a given sample, we might even be further away from the truth. As you can see here, when we narrow in super, super close, and I only have 93 people to work with or 15 people to work with, if I got a million different uh, samples of this, then on average, I would get 0.7 with these really, really narrow windows. But in this one sample, I'm very, very far away from it, right? Uh, so that's part of the trade-off that we have there. Next, granular running variables. The whole idea of regression discontinuity is we have a running variable and at some point we have a cutoff and then we compare people just on either side of the cutoff. They're basically the same person. But how closely can we get? Well, this sort of goes into the window thing, right? So what if instead of a continuously uh, changing running variable, we have something that's very granular? Uh, so let's say if our running variable was not the test score on our, a test score, but something like how many years of education have you had? 
Having, okay, if you had 11 years, 12 years, 13 years, 14 years, that's a pretty big jump, right? Can we really say if the cutoff is 12 years, let's say to get a high school degree, that people with 12 years of education and 13 years of education are basically the same, except that you, you just you just so happen to either fall on one either side of the line? Not really, right? Those are very different things, right? So if, you're, if your running variable is sort of clumped in big groups, it can be a little bit harder to justify that regression discontinuity. And the real question is, for the group on either side of the cutoff, can you really say that those two groups are basically the same on average? It's just that one got the treatment and one didn't. And that comes down a little bit to, uh, to, to you know, just what makes sense in a particular context. Uh, but that's the real question. Can you really justify when you have a granular jump like that? And usually you can. Now, there are regression discontinuity methods that try to deal with this and can be a little bit better about it than the traditional method. But that's not part of this class. For now, I'm going to say if you have a granular, lumpy running variable like that, you probably don't want to do regression discontinuity, uh, at least until you understand those other more advanced methods. Next, manipulated running variables. So let's think about the gifting and talented exa example again. So we have a running variable. If, you befall, if you're above 90, you get to go into your gifted and talented program. So what if you get an 89, really? But then the person grading your exam is like, oh, they got an 89. You know, th I, that kid's really smart. They really deserve being gifted and talented. They must have just had a bad day. I'm just going to put in the right answer here. I'm going to push them up to 90. And now this kid's got a 90, right? So and that's a, that's a pretty brazen example, but it happens, right? Uh, so you can imagine either the number being fudged a little bit because they know that they need to get above that cutoff, uh, or just if somebody's really close to the cutoff, they'd be like, oh, I really want to get above that cutoff. I, I think I'm going to get an 89, so I'm going to work extra hard to get the 90 in a way that somebody who thinks they're going to get a 92 might not do. So we want the running variable to basically be random around the cutoff, but what if it's not? What if it's intentionally being manipulated in some way? Well, then we're not going to be able to believe our regression discontinuity estimate because we're not going to be able to assume that people on either side of the cutoff are basically the same. So one way that we can look for this is look for lumpiness in our running variable around the cutoff. Uh, if we see that there happens to be, if we look at the distribution of our running variable and it looks you know, pretty constant, pretty constant, pretty constant, and then right before the cutoff it drops, and then right after the, con the, the, uh, the cutoff, it has a big spike. That sort of suggests that people were leaving this area and joining this area as though they were manipulating the running variable. Uh, so let's give an example of this. Uh, here's, an, here's an example from published papers. Uh, so as you probably know from this class, uh, I'm not that keen on hypothesis testing, although I do teach it. And the thing about hypothesis testing is that by default, we tend to use the significance level of 5%. Totally arbitrary, but whatever, okay. Um, and if you are below 5, if your p-value is below 0.05, then we would call that statistically significant at a standard level. If you are above 0.05, then you are not. So 0.51 or 0.051 uh, is insignificant. You didn't find anything. Uh, but a 0.049 is significant. You found something. And so we could imagine, oh, hey, you know, we could look at the significance level in studies and then use that as regression discontinuity because at, at 0.05, well, then that we can consider that significant. We can see if that affects things. You know, maybe people are more likely to implement a policy if it got a p-value, if the, the test of that policy got a p-value 0.049 but not 0.051, and we can look at the effect of that policy being implemented. Great, great, great. Except that it's a manipulated variable, right? Because for two reasons. One, if you're a researcher and you get a 0.051, you might be like, oh, no, I, I made a mistake. I'm going to go back and fix my mistake that I made. And oh, no, now it's a 0.049. Uh, whereas if you got the 0.049 in the first place, you might not try to look for the mistake. Uh, even if it's an actual mistake, you might not look for it. Or if it's a 0.051, the journal editor could just be like, nope, not publishing you. Uh, in which case, you know, we are getting selection into our sample based on whether you're on either side of the cutoff. So if we look at the distribution of p-values in published studies, we see a lot of lumping. Uh, so we see, if, uh, if we look on the right side, uh, we see relatively flat distribution. You're, you're about as likely to see a p-value from 0.05 to 0.06 as you are from 0.08 to 0.09, which makes sense. In completely random data, p-values will be uniformly distributed, right? You're as likely to get any p-value as any other if you're doing it on a basically no effect at all. But then at 0.05, it jumps, right? We see this big jump to the left of 0.05 here, uh, telling us that there's probably some people over here who are manipulating themselves to get over here, or possibly a bunch of studies that are supposed to fill in this area but never get published, right? So we have lumping here, so we can't really use this as a regression discontinuity because the, the, the assumption 
that were basically random on either side, randomly assigned to, to the treatment here, is, is does not really hold, right? Because instead of being randomly assigned to treatment, you are initially randomly assigned to treatment perhaps, but then you manipulate yourself so that you get published as well. Here's sort of what we want a distribution of a running variable to look like. You don't necessarily, it doesn't have to be uniform necessarily, but it should be pretty smooth, at least to where if you took away the line for the, cut, for the cutoff, you wouldn't know where it was. On the left, that's what we have here. On the right, that's definitely not what we have. If I took away that line, you would still definitely know where the cutoff is that people are trying to jump over. One way to test for this, by the way, in addition to looking at the distribution of the running variable, is to do a balance test at the cutoff. This is uh, the basic idea here is that you're doing a balanced table, which there's a video on balanced tables as well for the experiment section, uh, where you're just t you're taking a bunch of covariates and you're seeing if they are different on just on either side of the cutoff. And if you're basically randomly assigning treatment on either side of the cutoff, then there shouldn't be a whole lot of significant effects. Uh, but if there are a lot of significant effects, that tells us that maybe there's some manipulation going on and the assignment is not really random. Next, we're going to talk about f fuzzy regression discontinuity. So all the examples we've talked about so far have assumed that if you're on one side of the cutoff, you are not treated, and if you're on the other side of the cutoff, you are treated. But that's not how a lot of these things work. A lot of the time, you are less likely to be treated on one side of the cutoff and more likely to be treated on the other. So for example, uh, maybe if you if you look at the kids who got an 85 to 90, 89 on their on their exam, uh, maybe some of them get into gifted and talented anyway, uh, you know, because they have these really great other skills that, you know, maybe they're really great artists and so they get put in for that reason or something. And maybe on the other side, you know, people with a 90 to 95%, some of them don't want to do it, so they don't end up in, in gifted and talented either. Uh, so maybe you get 10% of kids just on the left of the cutoff getting treated, and maybe 90% of the kids on the right side of the cutoff getting treated. So it's not perfect in that way. Now, when that happens, we're going to underestimate the effect of the treatment, right? Because we're going to be assuming, basically, that there's zero people being treated over here and 100% people being treated over here. We're going to expect them to be 100% different to the, to, the, to the effect of the treatment. Uh, but if it's 10% over here and 90% over here, we're going to see that they're more similar, right? Because some people are actually getting treated over here. Some people are not getting treated over here. When in fact, uh, and so we're going to underestimate the effect of the treatment because we're going to expect it to have this effect when we see this effect, which is fine because it's still having that 80% effect, right? In fact, on 80% of people, we need to scale it up. So one way we can deal with this is using two stage least squares. There's a video on that as well. But the basic idea is this. Uh, we see how much the treatment rate jumps from one side to the other. And then we just scale up the effect that we get by the size of how much treatment itself jumps. That's the basic idea of it. All right. Those are some of the additional things we need to think about when we are doing regression discontinuity. Uh, we need to keep in mind uh, things like granular running variables. Does it make sense? If Can we really say that things are the same on either side of the data if we have these big chunks of people that we have to group all together? Or if we think that the variable is being manipulated in some way. Uh, we can think about windows. How big of an area around the cutoff do we need to look at? Uh, are we going to take a lot of people and get a very precise statistical estimate? Are we going to look at very few people and be very confident in our random assignment assumption? And then finally, we need to think about fuzzy regression discontinuity, uh, where it is not going from no treatment to treatment, but going to, from some treatment to more treatment, and then being able to adjust our estimate to deal with that. And then finally, one thing to keep in mind with all of this, as we're doing any of it, is think about what it is we are estimating with regression discontinuity. We are specifically estimating the effect for the people at the cutoff. Uh, so for the effect of gifted and talented, we are getting the effect of gifted and talented for somebody uh, who has an, an 89 or a 90, which might be different than from the effect of gifted and talented on somebody who had a 20. If we took that person who had a 20 and put them into the gifted and talented class, they might not get much from it. Similarly, somebody with a 100, maybe they don't need it at all. But we are getting the effect for the people at the jump because that's the, that's the variation in treatment that we are isolating here. And that's what we're doing. All right, that's it. Thank you very much.